Hey everybody, welcome to today's lesson. Today we're gonna to be talking a little bit about what is called the heat of fusion and the heat of vaporization. And these are important when we are discussing the energy associated with our phase changes. And so we are going to spend today and tomorrow talking a little bit more about the heat energy that's associated with our heating curves. Before we jump into the heat of fusion and heat of vaporization, I do want to again just reiterate um, and remind you that temperature and heat are two different things. So temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy. Um, kinetic energy. And again, that's the energy associated with the movement of our particles. So when we have something that is what we say a high temperature, our particles are moving very quickly. And when we have a low temperature, our particles are moving very slowly. Heat, on the other hand, is the flow or transfer of energy. And we uh, often refer to it as the flow or transfer due to temperature differences, okay? So for example, okay, um, we all, or you should be at least somewhat familiar with, if I were to take um, a cold ice cube and to place that cold ice cube in my hand, heat would flow from my hand into the ice, right? So heat flows from hot to cold temperatures. Okay, perfect. So we've talked a lot about the heating curve of water over the past couple of days. And so I did wanna use a different example of a heating curve um, just to show you the difference between the two. So here we have our heating curve of copper. As you can see, it looks very similar to the heating curve of water. In fact, almost all heating curves are gonna, have, well, all heating curves are gonna follow this general um, pathway, almost all of them anyways. Um, and uh, they might vary slightly in the amount of times that they spend in each different phase. But again, I just used a generic heating curve, just wanted to, to do something a little bit different here. So for the heating curve of copper, I'm interested in labeling my melting point and my boiling point. Now, just really quickly as review, right, portion A to B is where we see our substance as a solid. B to C is our phase change from solid to liquid. During C to D, we have just the liquid phase. D to E, we have the liquid changing to the gas phase and E to F is our gas phase. So that means that point B to point C, right, line BC is our melting point, okay? That's the position on the graph where we're gonna experience that melting point. And line D to line, or point D to point E, creating line DE, that's gonna be our boiling point or our vaporization point, okay? So this is where we will see our substance boil. Okay, so in order to determine the melting point and the boiling point of copper, I wanted to use this moment to introduce you guys to reference, or not introduce you to reference table S, but to remind you rather that anytime you are looking for a substance's melting point or boiling point, you can find that information on reference table S. So if you wanna take a moment and pause the video to practice finding melting point and boiling point, feel free to go ahead and pause and locate that in reference table S. Okay, so if you did not pause, that's fine. If you did pause, welcome back. Um, our melting points for point D, uh, now notice your graph is in Celsius, but the temperature that is listed on reference table S is in fact in Kelvin. And so the point that was listed in reference table S is 1,358 Kelvin as your melting point and, or I'm sorry, your melting point is BC and your boiling point is DE, which was listed as 2,835 Kelvin. Now, this equation given to you on this sheet, Kelvin equals degrees Celsius plus 273, 
This is a, an equation that is uh, found on reference table T, the back of your reference table. This information is provided for you, but this is how we convert between Celsius and Kelvin. So I'm given the Kelvin temperatures, 1358K, and I'm looking to uh, get to degrees Celsius. So in order to determine that, I have to subtract 273 from both sides, and that's going to give me a total of 1,085 degrees Celsius. So our melting point is 1,085 degrees Celsius. Our boiling point, on the other hand, again, same equation, 2835 Kelvin is equal to degrees Celsius plus 273. So in order to isolate our temperature in degrees Celsius, we are going to subtract 273 from each side, and that's going to give us a temperature of 2,562 degrees Celsius. 2,562 degrees Celsius. Now, just a quick reminder, looking at these temperatures, the melting point and the boiling point, both being over a thousand and well over a thousand, what information does this really tell us about the intermolecular forces or about the attraction between these, um, these particles? And it tells us that they're really high or that they have really strong attractive forces. Um, remember, copper is classified as a metal. It's made of that sea of electrons, that mobile sea of electrons. And those particles are held together with really strong attraction, really strong attractive forces. Okay, perfect. So my question then about this melting point and boiling point, we now know the temperature at which they have to melt and boil. And we know that that temperature, as we can see in our graph, stays constant throughout that phase change. But during that time, during point B to C and point D to E, even though our temperature is not increasing, we still are adding energy, right? Heat energy is still being added to our substance. So my question is how much energy is added during point B to C and how much energy is added during point D to E? And so in order to determine that, we have to take a look at what's called the heat of fusion and the heat of vaporization. And again, during these times, this energy, this is an increase in potential energy. Our energy is being used to separate the intermolecular forces of attraction. And, um, and yeah, so that's our potential energy increase on our graph. Okay, so let's go ahead first and talk about heat of fusion. So what is heat of fusion? The heat of fusion is the amount of energy required or amount of energy absorbed or released during the solid to liquid or liquid to solid phase change, okay? And the reason we say absorbed or released is because we're talking about whether or not we are adding heat energy during a heating curve or if we're releasing heat energy during a cooling curve, okay? And so uh, our equation that we're going to use to calculate, or I'm sorry, the, um, the equation that we use to calculate the heat during that portion of our graph is Q equals MH sub F meaning H with the subscript of an F. To break this down, the heat of fusion itself is this H sub F. Okay, so H sub F is our heat of fusion. Okay, our Q is our heat, that's just heat in general. Okay, and just so we're aware, we haven't really talked too much about heat itself, but heat is measured in joules, which is represented by big letter J, okay, joules. Okay, now, 
to, I mean, obviously we've talked about what M is and sorry for that long pause there, but I was trying to think of the way I wanted to word this. We've talked about M, but M should, M, it should be apparent that M should make a difference, okay? So the, the way that I wanna bring this up is if I have, let's say, a 600 gram ice cube or a one gram ice cube, which one of them will require less energy in order to undergo the phase change? Um, and that's gonna be my one gram cube. And the reason that I'm, I'm kind of posing it that way to you is because the mass is important and it is relevant to understanding this heat effusion, how much heat needs to be absorbed. So this is our mass. Okay, and it's measured in grams. Now, jumping really quickly back to heat of fusion here. Okay, heat of fusion, the units are joules per gram. And what this literally means is that it is how many joules of energy per every one gram of your substance does this require. And I also want to just make a quick note that a heat of fusion is a constant dependent on your substance, okay? So this is a constant depending on your substance. So for example, right, do you think that water or ice or H2O has a lower or higher or lower or greater uh, heat effusion compared to water? Do you think it takes more energy to convert ice to water or uh, solid copper to liquid copper. Um, and so the heat infusion varies based on substance. So I thought it would be interesting to go ahead and calculate the heat effusion then. And so there are there is some information that we do um, that we do require in order to solve this problem. And so or not rather not calculate the heat effusion, but calculate how much heat energy it takes. So let's make things easy. Let's assume that we have a 100 gram sample of copper, okay? And we also at this point then need the heat of fusion um, of copper, which our heat of fusion of copper is a given, again, 207 joules per gram. Now, again, I'm not asking you to, you, that's never listed for you. You guys actually won't be asked about heat effusion of copper at all. Um, if they do ask you about it, they will have to provide you with that information. Again, this is some sort of given. So let's go ahead and plug this into our calculator. So we have Q heat equals the mass times the heat effusion. Q equals 100 times the heat effusion, which is 207 okay, joules per gram. And I should have put grams in there. And so in order to solve for how much heat energy that, that would take, we would multiply 100 times 207, giving us 20,700 joules of energy. So if I were to take a 100 gram sample of copper and want to melt that down, I would need to input 20,700 joules of energy. Excellent. All right, so what is heat of vaporization then? Well, heat of fusion and heat of vaporization are very similar in terms of definition. They're just talking about two different phase changes. So heat of vaporization is the amount of energy uh, required or absorbed or released, I should say. Okay, just keep our definition similar. Um, in order to convert one gram of a liquid to a gas or a gas to a liquid. I don't know what made me define those very differently. They mean the exact same thing, right? It's how much energy is required in order to change a sample from a, a liquid to a gas or a gas to a liquid. Um, again, absorption would be, and I don't know why this just stopped writing, of course, on me, but here we go. So absorption would be the uh, liquid to gas phase, right, on the heating curve. That's where we're adding heat energy. 
and the release would be from the gas to a liquid. And again, this is when we're cooling things down. And we'll talk more about that, but again, we're always kind of viewing things in terms of a system, and the system in this case is copper. So in order to melt or to boil, copper has to absorb the heat, and in order to condense or to solidify, it has to release heat. Um, our equation for this is very similar, Q equals MH sub V, again, H with a V subscript. And again, this is very similar to our last equation, where Q is heat, M is mass, and H sub V is our heat of fusion. I'm sorry, heat of vaporization. Okay, so let's go ahead and then take a look at that same sample. And so again, we assumed that our sample was 100 grams. Okay, uh, let me go ahead and erase that. So we assumed that our sample was 100 grams. And in order to solve this, we do need to know the heat of vaporization of copper, which heat of vaporization is 5,069 joules per gram. So Q equals MH sub D. So we get Q equals 100 grams times 50, uh, 5,069 joules per gram. And so our final answer, we multiply those two values together to get 506,900 joules of energy, okay? So I want to take a moment to just point out, we used the same mass, right, same substance, copper, and I, I want to just take a moment to point out the, dis the, the distinctively large difference between these two amounts of energy. In order to melt that sample, in order to melt a 100 gram sample, it only took 20,700 joules of energy. But in, or, in order to vaporize that sample, it requires 506,900 joules of energy. And this is always the case. It's always gonna take more energy to vaporize than it is to uh, melt. And so why is that the case, okay? That's gonna be the case because if you think about going from a solid to a liquid phase, right? Our particles aren't really, we're not fully separating those intermolecular forces. To go from the liquid to the gas phase, right? We're really having to pull apart those molecules. And so the reason that they are um, distinctively different is that vaporization requires the particles to be separated um, a larger distance. Okay. All right, everybody. I'm already over the amount of time that I wanted, so I'm gonna pause here. We'll work on these questions in class tomorrow. Uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in and I will see you then.